Hey everyone, so it's the last time you're going to be hearing from me and hopefully uh, you all will be watching this video to get a short review of what to expect for your final exam um, and uh, a little bit of a study guide if you will. So just to let you know there are 33 questions on the exam, uh, 100 points total, two essay questions, um, and for those I give specific instructions for what I'm looking for and how the points will be broken down on those essay questions. So um, just do know that they're more than a short answer or a sentence or two. Um, I'm expecting a little bit, a couple paragraphs really for the essay answers. Um, there are six uh, true and false and short answer combination. I can't remember how many of each. Um, the true and false, remember I would, uh, not only do you have to give me an indication of whether or not the uh, statement is true or false, but you need to back up your explanation or your reason for selecting true or false. Um, and short answer, there's uh, for each of those, there will be instructions given. The remainder of the questions are all multiple choice and um, I hope to get those graded as soon as I possibly can after you get them submitted on the 18th. Um, you have four hours to take the exam. I leave a really large open window for the exam uh, because I do include those essay questions, the true, false, and the short answer. So um, I, I have never had anybody had problems completing the exam within a four hour time span, but certainly if you think you might have difficulty doing that, please let me know um, we can talk about alternatives. All right, so the review itself, like I said, this is gonna be short. I can't tell you what the actual answers or questions are, um, but I'm gonna go through just a couple of um, key points in relation to uh, the modules that were covered uh, since the midterm, essentially, since that first exam. So this is not a cumulative exam, so this is just every, all the content past that first module. So when we're thinking about um, rehabilitation counseling and mental health counseling, what I want you to do is review the roles of each counselor. Um, uh, uh, the differences between the two, what some job tasks might be for a mental health counselor versus a rehabilitation counselor. Um, take time reviewing the traditional process of uh, vocational rehabilitation within the state voc rehab system. I think it's important to know that. Um, what does it mean to become eligible for services? What is the timeline? What types of forms and paperwork um, might be completed within that VR process? What is an IPE or an IEP? So make sure you're familiar with some of the acronyms. Um, when you are thinking about the role of a counselor, I want you to be open to um, or thinking about um, the ways in which we provide counseling services these days. Um, you know, how do we communicate with our clients? Um, I've already mentioned the job tasks. Um, I definitely want you to review, and I know we kind of consistently talked about this, but I want to make sure that we ever, all, everybody has an understanding of the difference between um, graduating from a, um, a KCREP accredited program uh, versus a, a a program that's not accredited. Um, I want you to be very, um, I want to be very clear about, you know, the difference between being certified, being licensed, um, and just having been, have graduated a program or even your role as a student and what that might mean. Um, so make sure to review all of that type of information um, from those earlier modules after the first exam. I know I didn't do a lecture on Center for Independent Living, but I did provide some notes on that. So I definitely want you to review Centers for Independent Living. Um, I wanted to put some focus on that in the exam and make sure you guys were reviewing that for the exam uh, because even if you're not uh, going into the traditional rehabilitation counseling field, um, Centers for Independent Living can be very beneficial to any client um, that may uh, need some assistance with um, living independently, with accessing resources in the community, with getting modifications made to their home. Um, and so it's important to be aware of what those centers do, who are they made of, um, you know, what informed uh, their development, the civil, uh, the, the, the disability rights movement, the independent living movement, and all of that. Um, and also to be aware of what services can be connected to centers for independent living too. So I, I wanted to put some emphasis on that with this exam because it's important for every counselor, I think, to be aware of um, uh, the role of a center for independent living within their community. <laughs> um, so we uh, more recently reviewed um, multicultural issues, um, assistive technology, supervision, and advocacy. Um, so hopefully all that is pretty fresh in your brain. Um, so when it comes to culture and the, the multicultural module, um, so I want you to be sure to kind of review what areas of competence are important in terms of multicultural competence, um, why it's important to be self-reflective and have an understanding of your worldview, your values, your biases, and what that might mean. Um, in a counseling relationship. Um, 
I want you to just kind of review uh, how counseling services assessment, how all of um, the the services that we provide in counseling kind of historically have treated individuals from different cultural backgrounds, um, from marginalized uh, groups of individuals, um, and what that um, means overall for counseling today. Um, in terms of advocacy, make sure that you're aware of what the three levels of advocacy are, um, advocating with and for your clients, advocating at a community level or school level, um, and then advocating more in the political arena. Be, be clear, be sure that you're clear about what each of those levels might look like, what types of advocacy uh, might occur at each of those levels. Make sure to review the purpose of supervision. I put a little bit of information on that and I had um, uh, I talked about it in uh, one of the video lectures that I did. Um, so remember that there is a purpose to supervision. It's not just to uh, be an administrative supervisor, but rather um, a, more on a clinic, clinical supervision, clinical supervision, ugh, if I could spit this one out. It's more to be, uh, a, there's a difference between administrative supervision and clinical supervision. That's what I'm trying to get out here. Um, and the purpose of supervision is to be um, for that supervisor to sometimes be operating in like a consultant's role, a supervisor's role, an educator's role, um, or a counselor, counselor's role. So make sure that you're um, uh, kind of running through uh, um, those models of supervision and what they might look like, okay? Uh, and then kind of to wrap it up, the last uh, module that we focus on for the second part of the semester was on assistive technologies. And um, again, you know, I, kind of in the same vein as Centers for Independent Living, I think that a lot of our clients, regardless of what area we're working in, um, can benefit from certain types of assistive technologies, depending on what their age is, disability, and what uh, types of limitations they might be experiencing. So, um, and for exam purposes, you definitely want to be familiar with the law uh, that is uh, most poignant out there that reflects uh, the need for assistive technology services to be provided to individuals. So make sure you're familiar with the law. Um, I want you to be familiar with examples of assistive technology, so specific types of AT that are available and how they are connected to a certain disability population. So for example, if I ask you to provide me with like a case exam of a person with a disability, limitations they might be experiencing, and assistive technology that might be helpful, you know, you could certainly talk about an individual that um, has um, limited function in their upper extremities um, due to a repetitive strain injury that happened in the workplace, and, um, you know, they want to continue working uh, and typing on a computer, but they need some um, technology related computer modifications like an accessible keyboard, an accessible mouse, um, sip and puff system, something like that. That's a little extreme for somebody with just upper extremity limitations, but um, if they're still able to type alternative keyboards can be the AT option. So uh, make sure that you're just kind of clear about different um, assistive technologies that can be useful for different groups of individuals, like groups of individuals that have hearing impairments or experience hearing loss, individuals with vision impairments, um, mobility impairments. Um, so just kind of touch base on, on the types of AT that are out there. As always, you know, if you're concerned about, you know, your understanding about assistive technologies, go back, re-review the, um, the Job Accommodation Network website uh, for sure to kind of get a better idea or grasp on what types of assistive tech is available. Um, and also uh, kind of go back through and look at the ways that we might help clients identify assistive technologies. Um, no, we are not all AT professionals. Um, we don't have advanced certifications in assistive technologies, but we may be helping um, clients uh, uh, identify some type of technology that might help them in their day-to-day -day life or in the workplace. Um, and so there's kind of that step-by-step -step process that we go through to do that. Um, and so I think with that, I guess that it's a pretty short review, but I hope it um, helps. I hope it uh, kind of narrows down kind of the key points in the final exam. 33 questions is not a lot, uh, but certainly have a lot of time to complete it. So with that, um, I wish you all the best of luck and I uh, will um, uh, you know, be sure to get the, the grades posted as soon as I possibly can, okay?